So our topic for today is crisis the answer, right? <laughs> no, no. So we're going to be talking more about Jesus Christ, right? So in 2 Timothy 4, 2, what does it say there? Preach the word, right? And the word of God is Jesus Christ. So that's why we are preaching Jesus. Uh, say this with me. Jesus plus nothing is equals to everything. Amen. So um, in Colossians, we can see it contains the best exaltation of Jesus Christ, right? There's a lot in the, in, the, in the New Testament, but I think in Colossians, there's one that I really admire, you know, a, a best exaltation of who Jesus Christ is. So we're going to study uh, Colossians. We're going to touch a little bit of chapter 2 and chapter 3, and then chapter 4, hopefully, but just a summary of those, but mostly on chapter one, because there's so much in chapter one, it's just rich that the one hour and 20 minutes cannot <laughs> contain. <laughs> okay, otherwise we can be here forever. <laughs> we don't want to do that. Okay, so let's open our Bible on Colossians 1. I'm reading from NASB version, so let's read. Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus, by the will of God, and Timothy, our brother, to the saints and faithful brothers and sisters in Christ who are at Colossae, grace to you and peace from God our Father. We give thanks to God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, praying always for you, since we heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and the love which you have for all the saints because of the hope reserved for you in heaven, of which you previously heard in the word of truth, the gospel, which has come to you just as in all the world, also it is bearing fruit and increasing, even as it has been doing in you, also since the day you heard it and understood the grace of God in truth. Just as you learned it from a press, our beloved fellow band servant, who is a faithful servant of Christ on our behalf. And he also informed us of your love in the Spirit. For this reason, we also, since the day we heard about it, have not ceased praying for you and asking that you may be filled with the knowledge of his will in all spiritual wisdom and understanding so that you will walk in the manner worthy of the Lord to please him in all respects, bearing fruit in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God, strengthened with all power according to his glorious might for the attaining of all perseverance and patience joyously uh, and patience, joyously giving thanks to the Father who has qualified us to share in the inheritance of the saints in light. The in uh, verse 13, for he rescued us from the domain of darkness and transferred us to the kingdom of his beloved son in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation, for by him all things were created, both in the heavens and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things have been created through him and for him. He is before all things and in him all things hold together. He is also the head of the body, the church, and he is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, so that he himself will come to have first place in everything. For it was the Father's good pleasure for all the fullness to dwell in him, and through him to reconcile all things to himself, whether things on earth or things in heaven, having made peace through the blood of his cross. And although you were previously alienated and hostile in attitude, engaged in evil deeds, yet he has now reconciled you in his body of flesh 
through death in order to present you before him holy and blameless and beyond reproach. If indeed you continue in the faith firmly established and steadfast and not shifting from the hope of the gospel that you have heard, which was proclaimed in all creation under heaven and of which I, Paul, was made a minister. Now I rejoice in my suffering for your sake and in my flesh I am supplementing what is lacking in Christ's affliction in behalf of his body, which is the church. I was made a minister of this church according to the commission from God granted to me for your benefit so that I might fully carry out the preaching of the word of God. That is the mystery which had been hidden from the past ages and generation, but now has been revealed to his saints to whom God willed to make known what the wealth of the glory of this mystery among the Gentiles is, the mystery that is Christ in you, the hope of glory. We proclaim him admonishing every person and teaching every person with all wisdom so that we may present every person complete in Christ. For this purpose, I also labor, striving according to his power, which work mightily within me. Let's, uh, let's pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, we praise you and thank you, Lord, for the richness of your word, Lord. We thank you, Father, Lord, for Jesus Christ that is our everything. We thank you, Lord, that, Jesus, that you have given us Jesus Christ that is living in us, O oh God, and the richness of that Christ in us, O oh Father, Lord, is the hope of our glory. Lord, I pray, O oh God, that you will open our spiritual eyes into understanding, O oh God, all these revelations, Lord God, that you are pouring in us, O oh Father, Lord. I thank you, Lord, that you have blessed our church with your word, O oh God, with the knowledge that we need to hear, O oh God, with the wisdom that's coming from your spirit. We thank you, Lord, for everything in Jesus' name. Amen. So let us talk about first is the context of the Colossians, right? So we can have a full understanding. Again, Colossian is one of Paul's prison letter, right? So what are the prison letter of Paul? In school, I memorize it. It's Pepsi. What are those Pepsi? Philippians, Ephesians, Philemon, and then the C is Colossians. That's how I memorized it. <laughs> Okay, so, so Colossians is one of Paul's uh, prison letters, so that means Paul was on, uh, in prison when he wrote the, the Colossians. And this was um, during, it's a house arrest, I believe, that, that he was, I think it's his first imprisonment. So Paul was in prison when he wrote this letter, okay? And the Col Colossae was a small town in Roman province of Asia. It is located only 100 miles away from Ephesus. So they are close together and also close to La 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 Laodicea and close to Hierapolis. So that's why in chapter two, in chapter four, you can see these places mentioned uh, in there. Okay, so Colossae hosted many Jewish population and it's made up largely of Gentiles. These Gentiles, they, they have pagan practices, right? And pagan practices that, that converted to Christ. Right? So then these are, this, this Colossian church is a very young church, right? Their faith are still very young, okay? And then now, um, but they were infiltrated, infiltrated by these uh, false teachers, infiltrated by Jewish traditions, okay? Because in chapter 2, you will see um, mention about circumcision, right? They were infiltrated by philosophy, Okay, worldly philosophy. And then they were also infiltrated by their appearance of wisdom, right? They are talking about secret. There's some secret wisdom that is only available to very few elect or very few people, right? That not everybody has this parang may secret sauce or something like that, right? So it's every, only a very few people knows about this. Only very few people has this understanding, right? So all of this, with all this, there is that 
I remember Pastor Jose talks about syncretism. It's the mixing, right? There is religious mixing, right? They, they grab one thing here and grab one thing here, and they all mix together. And there is also an increasing, um, in, increasing knowledge on, on Gnosticism. Okay, Gnosticism is very bad. They don't believe that Jesus Christ is divine or Jesus Christ is God. They are thinking only that Jesus is an agent, right? It's God's agent that was sent into the world, right? That he has this, they call it Gnosis, it's a mystical knowledge, and that's why he was able to teach so Jesus is an agent of God. And so a lot of this that, that, that uh, Paul has to battle, Paul has to compete, is the challenges that Paul has to present Christ, right? That Paul has to present not only the nature, not only the, the humanity of Christ, but especially the divinity of Christ, right? So this happens, uh, Paul wrote Colossians, around 60 to 62 AD. And Jesus Christ died and resurrected thir around 33 or 34 AD. So when you think about it, that was only, it's not in even 100 years apart, right? It was only 30 years apart. And yet all of these confusing theories about Jesus are coming up. So that's why all this, when, uh, when you look onto the gospel, the, our New Testament, the gospel of Mark, Mark is the first one that was written. They said about 40 plus AD. And, and then the Matthew, Luke, all of these were written among, uh, uh, around 40, 50, 60 AD, right? So during that time, when the gospel, that's why it triggers these people of faith, it triggers these, these disciples and all these um, apostles to write on about Jesus Christ. They wrote because they have to defend the gospel. Right? John says in his book, he said, it was written so that they will believe that Jesus is the Son of God. So they have to defend the gospel in order for people to believe. And then when they wrote this one, it was already in circulation. The eyewitnesses, the eyewitnesses of Jesus Christ's death, burial, and resurrection was still alive during that time. That's why when you question the gospel, when you question the New Testament, it was proven, it was confirmed because it was written while the eyewitnesses are still alive. So there is reliability on our books, on our New Testament. Amen? So a lot of these things, because when I'm telling you all of this truth about Jesus Christ, sometimes it's mind-boggling, right? So this infinite, this finite mind sometimes cannot contain it. Right? That's why we have faith. Jesus gave us faith. Jesus gave us the spirit to understand the things of God. So all of this crazy thought about Jesus, there is, you know, I went to theology school and only to find out that there's a lot of weird ideas that are coming up. Right? Um, this Apollinarianism says, God is too holy. God is too... Um, to supreme of a being and so divine that he cannot be man, right? And there's somebody says that the human flesh, that, that, that humanity cannot be God. So there is no, they don't believe in that union, that hypostatic union, that Jesus 100% divine and Jesus 100% human is in, the, is in the flesh, it is in Jesus Christ. Right? So a lot of people are coming up with different theology, with different thinking, because they cannot contain it. That's why we guys, we believe in faith in our spirit. Right? So Christ alone, so all of these things are the ones that there's mysticism, there is um, worship of angels. Right? So a lot of this growing into the church of Colossae. Right? Into the church, the, the Colossians church. They call it the Colossian Hersey. Right? So then Paul, knowing that the church, Paul, does, Paul did not meet 
the, the, the church. He did not establish the church. It was established, it was believed established by Epaphras, right? Epaphras was saved under the ministry of Paul in Ephesus. Because remember, they are close together. Paul was in Ephesus twice, right? The first one was a short visit. Then he came back for more longer years, two and a half years, and stayed there. And so it was believed that Epaphras was the one who brought the gospel to the Colossians. It was believed that Epaphras was the one who founded the Colossian church. So it was such a young church, and Paul was bothered because when because Epaphras obviously visited Paul and reported. It was says in, in, in the first uh, few chapter here that they heard we give thanks for the Father of Jesus Christ, praying always for you, since we heard of your faith in Christ Jesus. Right? So he heard it from Epaphras that there is a growing church in, Col in, in, in Colossae, and now it was infiltrated by all of this uh, nonsense knowledge. Right? They, uh, they, are, they are depicting all these sorts of wisdom and philosophy. And so Paul, being the apostle of Christ, uh, was so concerned, right? Because it's just like us as parents, right? We are so concerned with the purity of our kids, right? The, puri the purity of their, of their belief, of their faith. So what do we do? We do everything to protect that faith. We do everything to... to um, to make sure that they don't get contaminated, right? When we have in, in, in Sunday school, we, we, um, we, we, we struggle, we, we talk, we brainstorm, and what are we teaching to our kids, right? Make sure that it's in the Bible, make sure that it is right, right? Make sure that we are prepared to answer the questions of our children because we want to maintain the purity of the gospel in, in their minds. Right? So that was Paul. Um, that was the reason why Paul um, write the, the 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 letter to the to the Colossians. It's the same thing with like like um, me, Alyssa, going to. At first, I, I I struggled, right? If she's gonna go far away, and then she's gonna be in a school that is with liberated minds, you know, going into the school that will contaminate her faith. I am so happy that she went into a Christian school. Right? I was questioned by, I know, one in, in one of the, um, the Christian in, uh, in Virginia Beach. Why here? Because she's already a Christian. She needs to go into the world to preach the gospel. But the thing is, can she handle it? Right? Sometimes you need to protect that faith. Even us, we need to protect our faith. Right? Do we just listen to people that are saying nonsense? You know, are we going to listen to a teaching that is not purely gospel? We also need to protect our faith. Do we, can we get contaminated? Yes, we can. Right? If we are not careful, we can still be swayed away. Okay? So that's why it says here that Paul's, Paul's um, reason why he wrote Colossians is to make sure that he promotes Christ, to exalt Christ. Because all of these beliefs and all of this teaching, it devalues Christ, right? So they are saying that Christ is not, is not divine, that Christ is just um, an agent of God, right? All of this Gnosticism, all these false teachers telling that, hey, you know, that they should believe or they should... Um, view the body as evil, worship angels, put their trust in worldly philosophy, and they were describing, that's why Paul is describing Christ, Christ as supreme, right? That Christ is above all of what they're talking about. Yeah, so that is the reason why Paul has, he has to present Christ as supreme, the supremacy of Christ. He has to present Christ as his preeminence. Right? He was there before the creation of the world. He has to present Christ as incomparable. He has to present Christ as sufficient. It is enough. Right? He has to present Christ as none of all these things that you were talking about can overcome, can be, 
ever compared to the glory that is in Christ Jesus. Right? So that's why we are going to, to, to tackle about this, um, about this letter of Paul, and we can see who Christ is. Right? We want to see, because it, Paul has presented it in a way that we can see who Christ is. Right? So let's um, go into um, verse 3. Uh, it says here that we give thanks to the Father, right? Paul was very thankful for the faith that they have in Jesus Christ. He was also thankful that the gospel was being preached to different parts of the world without him going into that, that there are other people preaching the gospel, right? He was thankful for this Epaphras, his brethren, that through his ministry, Right? It was becoming fruitful and fruitful and fruitful, and it's going from different parts of the world. And that is Paul was thankful for. Um, verse 9 here, For this reason, we also, since the day we heard about it, have not ceased praying for you and asking that you may be filled with the knowledge of his will in all spiritual wisdom and understanding. So when, when Paul says this, he sensed that this is the one that is lacking, right? That they are lacking in knowledge, right? That they are lacking in spiritual wisdom and understanding. So that's why it's very important. It's very highlighted for us Christians, the knowledge of the Word of God, right? What are we doing here day in and day out? Study the word, study the word, study the word. The importance there is we need to keep knowing and knowing and knowing Jesus Christ, right? We need to keep studying and studying because it says there spiritual, spiritual ignorance is oftentimes the source of confusion, the source of error, and the falling away. We believe about falling away. We don't believe in Calvin, once save, always save. We don't believe about that. We know that there is falling away of the faith, right? And we know that there's drifting away, right? In Hebrews, there is drifting away. It's slowly drifting away and drifting away. And before you know it, you're out. You're out of the body of Christ. You are living on your own. You're out of Christ. Right? So there is the importance of for us to keep knowing and knowing and knowing Christ. And we know that, um, as the song says, that, you know, he is new every morning, right? The steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. It is new every morning. It's like when we're reading our scripture, and I don't care how many times we read our Bible, there's always fresh revelation, right? I read my Bible so many times. And I believe you too, right? Because we are required, read your scripture, <laughs> read your Bible, right? But it's never ending revelation from God. Jesus, or God, the Father, can never, never run out of revelation. It's like the Atlantic Ocean, right? How many times, when, when, uh, even though how many times you use and, and use and get from the Atlantic Ocean, it will never run dry. It will never run out. So it's the same thing of Jesus Christ, of our God. God never ran out of revelation. God will never run out. It says in our scripture in Hebrews 11:6, right? That he is the rewarder of those who diligently seek him. Right? God rewards us. God keeps on giving us. You know, if God reveals himself in one day, this finite mind, it cannot contain, you know. God is so huge and so magnificent that our finite mind, he is infinite, and our finite mind cannot contain it. That's why he is beyond, you know, sometimes you cannot fathom, right? The word, the the. The, the song says that you are beautiful beyond description. You are beyond. You are imaginable, unimaginable. So sometimes our finite mind cannot contain. So that's why God, when he gives us revelation, he gives us a little by little of a revelation. But God rewards us when we keep on seeking him. 
He keeps rewarding us and rewarding us and revealing himself who he is. And the only thing with us is we open our, our, our spirit into, re, into receiving the revelation of God. Because sometimes our mind cannot, cannot contain it. And then we open. That's why we have faith. It is our faith that sees, right? It is through our spiritual eyes that we believe, right? Um, sometimes our mind cannot contain it. So this is the kind of, uh, of, of things that, that the Colossians need. They need knowledge. They need understanding, right? So what are our, 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 our mission team? Some of our mission team is in, the, is in the Philippines. What are they doing? The major thing that we do in mission is not medical mission, right? The major thing we do is conferences. The major thing we do is teaching the word, teaching the word, teaching the word. Because we are so much, there's so much embedded in us, there's so much deposit in us that we have to teach the gospel, right? We need to teach because our pastor is very good in teaching, you know, it's good with solid theology, and that's why he went, he, we go into the mission to what? To minister and to teach the gospel, right? And to keep teaching the people of God so that they will not be, uh, that, they, that they will know this mystery or they will know uh, whatever is lacking, okay, in their knowledge. So knowing God and who he is is our anchor to steadfastness, right? If we want to be steadfast in our faith, we need to keep knowing Jesus Christ, right? Uh, for Jesus, even in Jesus' farewell speech, he said, if you abide in me, what is that says? You abide in my word, right? The word of God and Jesus Christ, they hand in hand. So that's why when we abide, when, if we want to be steadfast with our faith, make sure that we abide in his word. Make sure we have to have full understanding um, I know the priest, the Catholic priest says, they are the only ones that can read the Bible because they are the only ones. It's like they are the, the, the high and mighty that, can, that are the only ones that can understand the scripture. But no, it says that we read the scriptures and God will give us the understanding. Amen. All of us are um, commanded by God to read the scriptures. Right? And so we can always understand and we can always know about the gospel. Let's go to verse 10. So that you will walk in a manner worthy of the Lord, to please him in all aspects, bearing fruit in every good work, and increasing the knowledge of God, strengthened with all power, according to his glorious might, for the attaining of all perseverance and patience, joyously, giving thanks to the Father, who has qualified us to share in the inheritance of the saints in light. So we are qualified to share in the inheritance. What is the inheritance? We are called to be co-heirs. We are called to whatever Christ has the inheritance is we are to share into that inheritance, right? Uh, verse 13, For he rescued us from the domain of darkness and transferred us to the kingdom of his beloved Son, in whom we have redemption and forgiveness of sins. So what is this? We already have redemption. Because of Jesus Christ, we already have redemption and even the forgiveness of our sins. The forgiveness of our sins is our past, present, and future, right? God, what is that? The forgiveness of sin, not that we are not no longer sinning. It's just God destroyed the power of sin, right? There is no power of sin over us, so we are no longer, remember in Romans, we died, we died to our sins, right? And we are no longer slaves to our sins. And so God has given us that forgiveness of our sins. We have now redemption and that forgiveness of our sins, right? So now, what, what are we? That's why we no longer keep on sinning. We are, we are no longer go, doing that habitual sin. 
But sometimes I know we understand we have that incidental sin and we ask God for forgiveness, right? We ask God for forgiveness, but that, that habitual sin, that is still the power of sin over us. But we no, we no longer live in that habitual sin. We no longer keep on sinning, right? We no longer keep on sinning, although we are not perfect. But the power of sin is not over us. God has already removed that power of sin over us, right? Um, so we were already released from the dominion of darkness, and our sins were forgiven. And verse 15, it says, he is the image of the invisible God, right? Sometimes we see, oh, who was that in the Bible? Philip says, God, Jesus, show us the Father, Right? Have you not seen me, Philip? When you see me, you've seen the Father. So God, you know how, how generous God is? God has been wanting, wanting to be with us. Right? God is wanting to be with us. So what he, did he do? He sent Jesus Christ so that the invisible God becomes visible. The unknowable God, God all the way, you know, from a distance they call it. The unknowable God now is knowable, right? It is in the person of Jesus Christ because he is the image, he is the likeness, he is the manifestation of God, of, uh, of God that is fully revealed in Jesus Christ. He is God himself, is now revealed to us, is now visible to us, is now knowable to us, and now living in us. Right? So that is Jesus. He is the image of the invisible God. And he is the firstborn of all creation. Right? So this firstborn of all creation is also um, uh, debatable. right? Because Paul uses this, this firstborn to describe who God is, who Jesus is. Because a lot of people talk about Jesus is the firstborn. He is like... He is the firstborn. He is the first created being. They are still going into that Jesus is a create creature. Jesus is created by God. Right? But no, Paul wrote this there. He is the firstborn of all creation. Firstborn here indicates that it does not indicate that Jesus is less than God, but it, it indicates the priority or the supremacy in rank. Right? It was referred also for a messianic title. If we go into um, Psalms 89, 27, also I will make him my firstborn, the highest of the kings of the earth. So it is a messianic title, right? Even the Israelites, they are called the firstborn of God, right? So this is, this is, this is um, it indicates only that Jesus is it is in the messianic title. That's why it was called the firstborn. Okay? But Jesus is no way uh, lesser than, um, lesser than, you know, he is not the created being. Right? So this Gnosticism, is, it teaches about Jesus as one of God's creation. Right? Here again, the firstborn, he was, the enlightened, he was enlightened by Logos. Why is this Gnosis, Logos, or the mystical knowledge? He was enlightened by mystical knowledge, and that's why he was able to teach his disciples. They refused to believe that Jesus is God. Okay? And that was Paul is battling, and why? No, Jesus is the image of the invisible God. He is the firstborn of all creation. So here... Um, they're talking about a lot of this spiritual knowledge is too high for everyone, okay? And that is only, it's a lot of mixing of this Gnosticism here. And um, let's go to verse 16. For by him all things were created. So it was says that Jesus is the firstborn of all creation, and by him all things were created, both in the heavens and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities. All things have been created through him, through him and for him. So he was created, he was above all these thrones, 
All of these dominions, all of these mystical beings, elemental beings, they worship angels, they worship the stars, but Jesus is above all of those. Right? So Paul is presenting here that Jesus is even above all the rulers and the authorities and everything else in this world, right? He is before all things. He is the preeminence, right? He is before all things, right? Before the world was created, he already existed, right? Before all things and in him all things hold together, okay? So everything was was there and it's Jesus, okay? So he is also the head of the body, the church, and he is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead. Uh, it, the, 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 the way it's stated, the firstborn from the dead, the firstborn from among the dead connects Christ to the church and to the resurrected, to the, uh, to the hope of resurrection. Okay? And what else it says here? So that he himself will come to have first place in everything. For it was the Father's good pleasure for all the fullness to dwell in him. So what is this saying? Because of, the, of God's pleasure, all the fullness dwells in him. That means that all the fullness of the Godhead, God the Father, God the Son, and God the Spirit, is on Jesus. All the fullness of the Godness, of the, of the triune God, is uh, dwells on him. We can also check that out in Colossians 2, verse 9. For in him all the fullness of the deity dwells in bodily form. So all the fullness, because of God's pleasure, because of God's, um, the Father's good pleasure on Jesus Christ, all the fullness dwells in, in him, right? And all the fullness of the deity dwells in Jesus Christ. And although you were previously, and then verse 21 here, and although you were previously alienated, we were previously alienated. What does it mean? We were previously strangers, right? We were alien. We are not of God. Right? We are outside of him. So what we have, we have nothing. We are hopeless. Without God, without Jesus, we are hopeless. We are nobody. Right? These are the Gentile world. We are in the Gentile world. world. And because of, of that, uh, before a person becomes born again, there is no hope for us. Right? We are aliens in this world, and we are nobody. We have no hope without God. Right? And so all, although we were previously alienated and hostile in attitude, engaged in evil deeds, yet he has now reconciled you in his body of flesh through death. So now Jesus did not only... Um, uh, did not only redeemed us, right? Did not only forgiven us. He, now he reconciled us, right? He reconciled us um, in his body of flesh through death in order to present you before him holy and blameless and beyond reproach. This, this doesn't mean that we have not done anything wrong, right? But he changes us, and because of Jesus, we become holy, right? We are, he, he keeps on changing us in order for him to present us to God, right? In order for him to present us, he has to change us to become holy and blameless, right? So while we are, we are here on earth, we are being changed, right? We are being transformed. It says in, in, in um, 2 Corinthians... 318, that we are being transformed or changed from glory to glory, right? So Jesus has to change us in order for us to be able to present, in order for him to present us to, uh, to God the Father, right? Uh, verse 23, if indeed you continue in the faith, firmly established and steadfast, 
and not shifting from the hope of the gospel that you have heard, which was proclaimed in all creation under heaven, and of which I, Paul, was made a minister. Now I rejoice in my suffering for your sake, and in my flesh I am supplementing what is lacking in Christ's affliction. In behalf of his body, which is the Christ, which is, which is the church, I was made a minister of this church according to the commission from, from God granted to me for your benefit, so that I might fully carry out the preaching out of the word of God. That is the mystery which has been hidden from the past ages and generation that has now been revealed to his saints, to whom God willed to make known what the wealth of the glory of this mystery among the Gentile is, the mystery that is Christ in you, the hope of glory. So Jesus literally living in us, right? That Christ in us is the hope of glory, right? It was hidden, it says, he, it which has been hidden from the past ages and generation but now has been revealed to his saints, right? So who are this past generation, right? Our Old Testament, right? They were hidden through that Old Testament, and now it was revealed. We are now in the new era, right? We are now in the New Testament. And now it was revealed because Jesus came. Jesus came and died on the cross, and now we have this new covenant in Jesus' name. And that Christ in you, the hope of glory. Right? So it, if you think, if you are being discouraged, or if you think you are the weakest saints in the body of Christ, hey, there is something in you that none of those Old Testament has. Right? What does those... New Testament, the Old Testament, they are looking forward for that. But they never had, they never received the promise. So what was that that we have that they don't? It is the Christ in us, the hope of glory. Right? Abraham, our Abraham, Isaac, and, and Jacob, they never have the Christ in us, the hope of glory. Right? That is the beauty, right? Remember who is with Christ? The fullness of the Godhead, the fullness of the deity, the fullness, the God of Father, God of Son, God of the Holy Spirit, the fullness of the deity, Christ is in Christ, and now where is Christ? Christ in us, the hope of glory. We're going to go back in that hope of glory because it's, it's very rich, right? So when Christ is in us, so when Christ is in us, does not see, so Christ is in us, we should not see defeat, right? What do we see then? Victory, right? When Christ is in us, we should not see oppression. What do we have then? Deliverance. When Christ is in us, do we see sickness and diseases? We only see what? Healing. So now we can, you can look on ourselves. We can see in us that there is Christ in us. The power, the authority of Jesus Christ is in us, lives in us. Amen? That's why there is no defeat there is no failure. I know sometimes we feel failure. Sometimes we feel discouragement, right? Sometimes we feel hopeless. But hey, look inside of you. Open your spiritual eyes. What is that? Sometimes we are, what do you call this one? We become, sometimes we, we become, uh, we see things in the natural eyes, right? We see work every day. We see um, our struggles, our co-workers, you know. We see all of these different things in the world, but that's in the natural eye, right? We sometimes forget to open our spiritual eyes. That, hey, what do you have? Christ in me, the hope of glory. That's very rich, right? 
So that means that the Christ in us, the Christ in us means prosperity, right? There should be no poverty. There should be no, um, no sickness, no, no, no discouragement. We need to always keep on seeing on the Christ in us. Yes, yes, it is a mystery. Christ, uh, Paul says here, because they are talking about mystical, all this mystery, you know. But Paul says also, hey, there is a mystery. Yes, that this mystery is in Christ, right? That this knowledge, this, this is nothing compared to your worldly knowledge. This is nothing compared to your worldly philosophy. Hey, that Christ, that all that knowledge is in Christ, right? That yes, there is a mystery, and that is Christ, right? And that is, um, it is also mystery, it, it remains a mystery for the world, right? It remains a mystery for those people who does not know Christ. This mystery is revealed to who? To the people of God, right? It's not revealed to everybody, Right? They're talking about this, this, this false teachers talking about only very few, the high and mighty, only this high and mighty has the knowledge, has the special knowledge. Right? But no, Christ says it's open to everyone as long as they are in Christ because this knowledge is found in Christ. Right? So that's the difference between the Gnosticism and Christ. The mystery was revealed for, for all of us, okay? The mystery is revealed, and Christ is enough and sufficient. It's all, everything is in Jesus Christ. You know, if you think about the fullness of the Godhead in Jesus Christ, that is everything, right? You should not be looking for anything, okay? So, <clears throat> so Jesus is everything, and we just need to open our minds into understanding these things, right? So, so who Jesus is, Jesus is everything. He is not the emanation of God. All this, this emanation, I know I studied this, right? There's a lot of different things that these people talk about. Emanation is like this is God, a powerful God, and there's a force that was sent out. And Jesus is that emanation of God. It, that's part of the force that God has sent out. And Jesus is part of that, right? So there's so much going on into the people's mind just to, for them to explain who Jesus is. They cannot accept the fact that Jesus is God, right? So Jesus is not the emanation of God. He is the image of the invisible God. And if you've seen me, he said, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father, right? Um, and he is not the agent of God, just like the Gnostics are, are talking about. He is part of the Trinity, right? All things was created by him and through him. He is in the beginning, and then he is part of that creation, right? So in, so in everything, he has the supremacy, he has all authority. Nothing exists without Jesus. He is the head of the church. That's why, because he is the head of the church, he still gets the supremacy. He is still he the head of the church. He's still supreme, right? God was pleased to have his fullness dwell in him. And that's why we trust the teaching that Jesus is less than the, might, the almighty God. And through Christ, he reconciled us to himself and not only that, Jesus created us. He also shed. So what did Jesus do to us? He first, he started it all. Jesus started it all. He first created us. Of course, man fall. What did he do? He, he redeemed us, right? He forgave our sins. He redeemed us from our sins. And then he reconciled us to God. And that by entering, dwelling in us, in dwelling in us, he is changing us, right? He is changing us. It's only, and then when, when he's changing us, he's preparing us from glory to glory, right? 
So what is that beauty that Jesus did to us? Right? He did not only stop and reconciling us to God, but he keeps on changing us. And he keeps on sanctifying us. And that's why there's importance of the word of God, right? The importance of the word of God is, James says, it's the mirror. You see yourself. And that's why when you're seeing yourself, you see sometimes how filthy you are. You can see how, how dirty you are. And it causes you to ask for forgiveness. It causes you to humble yourself before God and ask for forgiveness. You're seeing yourself, right? And, 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 and then when you're seeing yourself, it causes. And what else? It cleanses us. The word of God, it cleanses. It reminds us who God is. It reminds us who Christ is in us, right? It reminds who we are in Christ. And that cleanses us and it sanctifies us. And that constant sanctification, 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 that is the process of glorification, right? So that was Christ in us, the hope of glory, right? So that is the process of uh, glorification, so Jesus, Jesus started your life, and he will end your life, right? He is the one in between. He is the one that created us, the one that gives us the purpose, the one that gives us the gifts and the talents, the one who's giving us fresh revelation. It's like everything is Jesus Christ. That's why we cannot be prideful, right? We cannot, you know, take pride of our accomplishments, right? Because everything is Jesus Christ. And that's why when I was saying that um, sometimes God enables you to do something that is beyond you, right? So when you are doing things that is beyond you, you know that you, it is no longer you who's doing it. It is the Christ in you that is enabling you to do it, right? Because we know that it is Christ that is enabling us to do it. How can we be prideful, right? It is not me. It is not my talents. It is not my ability. It is the Christ in me that is enabling me, right? This is, that's why sometimes when, you know, when, you ask, when we are tasked to preach, to teach, right? The pouring out of revelation, of revelation, of revelation, of revelation. That is not out of my knowledge. That is not how good, you know, you make your outline, how best you are and how you good in preaching. It is not you anymore. It is the Christ that is enabling me, right? It is the pouring of revelation. And I said, Lord, there is so much revelation. It is not my knowledge my wisdom or whatever that I have. It is no longer my talents, my abilities. No, it is God Christ in me that is enabling me. It is the revelation. There's so much revelation that sometimes you just don't know how to fit it in, in your outline, right? How to, how to make it solid outline, right? There's so much revelation that God is pouring and pouring. And it's just so, it is so good to know that whatever task that God is giving us, whatever task that God wants us to do, He supplies it, right? He supplies the knowledge, He supplies the ability, He supplies the strength, right? He supplies the, the, the needs of your body. He enables us in order for us to carry on the task. That's why there is no, we cannot uh, take pride of anything, right? There's, there's nothing that you can take pride of. It is the Jesus that is enabling us. So the one that will hold us together every day, every season, every challenges, every trials, every issues of our lives, it is Jesus, right? Jesus is very involved in our lives. Well, he's part of us, right? It is like Jesus, it, it is not Jesus and Cheryl. Ooh, nice team, right? Good team. No, it is not Jesus and Cheryl, but it is Jesus in Cheryl, right? 
There is already union. We are united with Christ. It is not one plus one. It is Jesus in us. Right? Jesus in us. And that's why we, he's very involved, he's very engaged in our lives, right? There's another theory, they call it deism, that, that believes that God created the world and then he has nothing to do with it. Right? God created it and he left it alone. That is a wrong theory, of course, right? Because we know that our God has sent Jesus Christ to die for us, and that Jesus Christ is in us, is very involved and very engaged in our daily lives, right? So he will always remind us of his presence. Jesus is always reminding us of his presence. He reminds us that he is with us all the time. He is engaged with us. He is involved in our lives, right? So everything, we are already in Christ. Christ already came in to dwell in us, to tabernacle in us, or, or to live in us, right? So this mystery is already revealed, and we know about this mystery, right? So remember that Ephesians 2, 6, if you are saved by grace through faith, it will always be grace through faith, right? I was saved, so it's always, always, I was saved when I was 18 years old. I was saved through, by grace through faith, and now I am 54 years old, and I will be, still be grace through faith, right? So we always have to remember that. Because what happens to the Galatians, they were saved by grace through faith, and they end up with good works, right? So we always have to go back, and if we think that we are doing things by good works, now we have to remind ourselves we are saved by God. We are saved by grace through faith, right? That faith is in Jesus Christ, right? So here's the book of Colossians. Jesus is everything. We know about that. Christ is the answer. Jesus is everything, and that Jesus is everything is in us, and that Jesus is everything is in us. It's that Jesus changes everything, and that's why we are being changed, right? We are being renewed. So our lifestyles, what is that? He changes our lifestyle, our habits, our attitudes. He changes the way we think, right? The power that he renews our minds, right? Taking our minds captive into the word of God. And then he transforms us into a normal human behavior, into a Christ-centered behavior from our normal human. You know, sometimes it is impossible to love the unlovable, right? <laughs> but Jesus is transforming us to love even the unlovable, right? So those normal behavior, right? Those are the normal behavior. Sometimes we, we um, what they call, we get upset, right? We get mad. But Jesus is transforming us, right? Jesus is changing us, right? So that we don't have to dwell with the negativity of this world. We don't have to dwell with this, all this, uh, 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 um, a lot of bad things that's going on, the social media and all that kind of thing, right? Jesus is changing us. We become the light of the world, right? Because Jesus has changed our, our mindset, um, we, be, we, be, we are being changed, right? So if, Jesus see, if we see Jesus is everything and everything we got is Jesus, Jesus in me changes everything, right? It's only through Jesus that it's changing things, right? The wives will tell, I will change my husband. The husband will say, I will change my wife. Or the parent says, I want my children to change. I will change my children, right? If you want them change, it is through the power of Jesus Christ, right? Get them born again so they will change, right? 
If you have unbelieving husband, get them born again. You know, because it's only the power of Jesus Christ that can change us. Sometimes we want that, you know, gusto nating sakalin. <laughs> right? But sometimes we are just, we don't have that power. Only Jesus Christ can change us. Only Jesus Christ can change everything. So then, um, let's go to Colossians 4.18. Uh, I like to um, mention this one. It says here, so Paul mentioned all, there's a lot of people mentioned the co-workers of Paul and all that in the uh, previous verse. But here, I, Paul, I'm writing this greeting with my own hand. Remember my chains. Grace be with you. So this, we know that this, this Colossians was written when Paul was in prison, right? He says, remember my chains. My, my chains. And he said that I am in Christ and Christ is in me, the hope of glory. So what is he's, he's showing here? So, hey, whatever circumstances we have in our life, right? Our problems, our relationship issues, sickness, diseases, but nothing can stop the Christ in us. Right? Why did Paul say that? He was the one who says, Christ in me, the hope of glory, right? And then he says, remember me, my chains. So he's showing his circumstances, He's showing the circumstances that, hey, I am in chains. So whatever is happening in our lives, right, and our, you know, different pressures or different issues in our life, right, um, nothing has changed. Still the Christ, still the spiritual position of Christ in us is still the same, right? And our spiritual position in Christ has never changed. So whatever circumstances we have, so we do not be discouraged, right? Sometimes we are going through life's struggles, right? Life's um, testings and trials. We should not be discouraged because nothing has changed. We still have the Christ in us, the hope of glory, right? So he's saying that, hey, whatever struggles you are doing, is saying that, hey, he's not done with us yet. Although we are going through testings and trials, for God to invest so much for the fullness of the Godhead, right? The fullness of the Godhead is in Christ, and Christ is in us. That is a lot of investment, right? The heaven, you know, is given to us. That is a lot of investment. But do you think God is done with us? No. <laughs> Praise God. God is not done with us because he has invested so much in us. So that's why we are not finished. We are not done yet. Can we say, I am not done yet? <laughs> Amen. So if you have hopes and visions and all of those things that you want to do in Christ, we are not done yet. So Paul says, hey, look at my chain. That did not stop Paul from preaching. It did not stop Paul from writing, encouraging, uplifting the Colossians church because he knows that Christ in him is the hope of glory, right? So now we have to keep on looking, looking on who Christ is in us. Okay? So let's go back into the Christ in you, the hope of glory. Right? The scripture teaches us that the resurrected saints will share in the glory of Christ. Right? So that's why here, you know, praise to him that started it all. So first he created us, he redeemed us, he changes us, he uses us for his purpose. The one that is supreme and sufficient and our own is our all in all. He alone is worthy of our praise, not only to all of the above, but lastly, praise to him that will share his glory. Right? So he, not only that all those things that was enumerated was given to us, now let's see about this glory. Right? So let us see 
What does he mean, Christ in you, the hope of glory? So let's go to Romans 8, 16 to 17. Because this is the Spirit himself testify with our spirit, right? It says here that now if we are children, then we are heirs, heirs of God and co-heirs with Christ. If indeed we share in his suffering, in order that we may also share in his glory. So what does this mean to share in God's glory? Huh? It means to share into what? It to share into the divine splendor. We are going to share the honor and the majesty of Christ, right? We are going to, to share the divine, the glorious, the glorious God in heaven. Is being shared to us, right? The glorified saints will share in the divine nature of God. So God um, gives us, you know, make us into his own image, into his own likeness. There's all, so much that God has shared to us, right? So much of his, um, even his non-communicable um, attributes, Right? All of these attributes of God was shared to us. He shared to us his eternity. Right? We are nothing. We are alienated. We are strangers. We are nobody. Right? If we think of it, how special we are in Christ, because to begin with, we are nobody, and yet Christ has um, revealed all of these things to us. And to share his glory, right? To share his splendor, his majesty, his divine nature to us, right? He's sharing it to us, right? If we go into 2 Peter 1, 4, through this, he has given us his very great and precious promises so that through them, you may participate in the divine nature. So that's why it's saying there, we are going to participate in the divine nature. Having escaped the corruption in the world caused by evil desires. So we're going to escape this corruption of our corruption, right? We are going to be raised up from, from corruptible to incorruptible, right? By the twinkling of an eye, we are being transformed. By the twinkling of an, of an eye, we are transfigured. We are going to live this mortal body and we are going to gain an immortal body, right? So that is the beauty here. It is unbelievable that, you know, sometimes it's just hard to comprehend that all of this, that God, that Jesus is willing to share to us even his glory, right? And even his eternal life, that eternal life, the Zoe kind of life, it's a God kind of life. And it's being shared to us. And now we enjoy eternal life, right? Only God or Jesus can have eternal life because they are divine being, right? They are divine. We are, what are we? We are just human beings. We are creatures, right? We are a created being. And yet God has highlighted us. God has promoted us. God has elevated us. Right? That you are not going to live in that body. I am going to transform you into a glorified body. Right? So even here on earth, there is that sanctification, 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 cleansing, cleansing. We are being purged, right? We are purged from these evil things. We are purged in all these things that, that causes us to sin. We are being changed from here, glory to glory, because in the twinkling of an eye, we have to be prepared, right? We are the bride of Christ, yeah, right? Va Brother Val says, the bride of Christ, it talks about the bride of Christ. Our bridegroom is coming, and when the bridegroom comes, we are ready, right? We are sanctified and sanctified and ready to be glorified. And that is the Christ in us, the hope of glory, because we are going to have a glorified body. And you know that God, the kind of holiness that God has, 
cannot be defiled. Right? That's why Jesus here cannot be defiled. And for us to meet God in heaven, as here we have to be transformed. We have to leave all this body, this, this mortal body. We have to leave this sinful body. We have to meet God in our glorified body, in our sanctified one, right? Blameless, holy, pure, white, right? Because we are the bride of Christ, Jesus is coming. Jesus is taking us up and bringing us, presenting us to God the Father. Amen? Sometimes it's hard to, you know, when you think of it, when you're just your finite mind, think about it. It's not, it's an incomprehensible, right? We believe in our spirit. We believe in faith, right? We are not like those theologians, some of those scholars. They get cuckoo, right? They get crazy thinking, right? Because using your mind is making you crazy. We don't, in the things of God, we don't use our mind. We use our spirit. Right? That's why God has given us the Spirit, that, that the Spirit of God can communicate through our spirit. We are walking in the faith, right? We are walking in faith. We are seeing things in our spiritual eyes. We are seeing, seeing things through faith. Right? It is not through reason, because this cannot reason anymore. There are things that are beyond us. It says that no eyes have seen, no ears have heard, what God has prepared for those who love him. So that means all of this mystery that was revealed to us, that Christ in us, the hope of glory, is nothing. That means that there is more that will be revealed to us. Maybe there is more that will be revealed to us, right? Because there is still no, see, no eyes have seen, no ears have heard. And what it says is that your present suffering is nothing compared to the glory that will be revealed to us. It says will be revealed to us. So there is more to it than what is revealed to us. Amen? There is more to it than what was given to us. So I'm thinking, Lord, is there more? Because whatever is revealed to us now is just... It's just beyond, it's mind-boggling, right? It's beyond my, my mind to understand. But my spirit is receiving it, right? It is by faith that we are receiving it. But then we are going to have a glorified body, right? That, that, that seeing all of this, that, that God shared his glory to us, is a generous God, right? A very generous God. You know, all of these things that was given to us, all of these things that we enjoy, is out of God's generosity. Does he have to give it to us? No, he doesn't need to give it to us. He already redeemed us. He already rescued us. He already uh, brought us from darkness into light, right? He already did this to us. He doesn't have to share his glory. Yet because we have such a generous God, that he shared his glory, right? That's why Sister Anne is talking about Thanksgiving. We are going to celebrate our Thanksgiving. And that part of that celebration is we say, Lord, thank you. And with all the blessings and all these things that we receive and we enjoy, what do we give to God? A $10, a $20, oh, just tips, right? We give God tips, right? We are becoming so stingy. Why are you so stingy with God? God has blessed you so much that his glory was shared to you. And yet, I'm just going to give God this. I'm just going to give God this. Right? We're very stingy, right? Oh, I don't have time. Right? Even for us adults, we don't have time. Let the young people do the work. Right? But remember... We are not done yet, right? We are not finished yet because God has invested so much in us, right? God is our generous God, right? All the attributes, all the attributes, love, joy, peace, all these attributes of God was given to us, right? 
in Philippians 3.21, their destiny is destruction, their God is their stomach, and their glory is their shame. Their mindset is on earthly things, but our citizenship is in heaven, and we eagerly await a Savior from there, the Lord Jesus Christ who by the power that enables him to bring everything under his control will transform our lowly bodies to that will be like his glorious body. So how God was resurrected, how Jesus was resurrected, we are also going to resurrect. We're always going to have our glorious body, right? There is no shame in us. There is no... uh, Immor- there is no mortality in us, right? First John 3, 2, Dear friends, now we are children of God, and what we will be has not yet been made known. But we know that when Christ appears, we shall be like him, right? For we shall see him as he is. So God, we are going to be like, like God, like Jesus, Right? Psalm 17, 15, As for me, I shall behold your face in righteousness. I shall be satisfied with your likeness when I awake. I will be, it's likeness, right? That likeness in us, right? Um, so now let's read this 2 Corinthians three eighteen. But we all with unveiled faces, looking as in a mirror at the glory of the Lord, are being transformed into the, shame, into the same image from glory to glory, just as from the Lord the, the, the Lord, the Spirit. So we are being transformed from glory to glory, and we are going to enjoy that glorious, um, the, 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 the shared glory of God to us, right? Our destiny as Christian, if we remain faithful, is to become like God sharing in his glory for all eternity. Isn't that good? We are sharing God's glory for all eternity. If you feel like you're not popular in school, hey, you will be sharing God's glory for eternity. If you feel you're not the prettiest one in school, hey, you are sharing God's glory for all eternity. Right? Um, so this mystery that was hidden from ages and from generation now has been revealed to us, right? That is the good mystery that was revealed to us that now we have to enjoy, right? So then, but we need to be steadfast, right? We talk about the falling, the falling of the faith. We, we talk about falling, right? We talk about this, uh, the, 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 the drifting of the faith. How do we remain steadfast? Right? God says that you abide in me and my word abide in you. So again, it is on the study of the word of God. Right? We keep on studying. We don't stop on studying on the word of God. Right? We don't stop on hearing the gospel. We don't stop in listening to whenever people are preaching here. Right? Or we are, are what they call physically present but mentally absent. Our mind is going somewhere else. And so we are not understanding what is being preached. Right? So we need to be attentive to the preaching of the word of God. We need to be attentive into the reading of our scripture. It is through the reading of the scripture that we keep knowing and knowing and knowing and knowing and understanding and understanding and understanding so that we don't get corrupted, so that what we don't get, uh, our faith doesn't get contaminated. Right? That we are solid in our belief in our and uh, solid in our in our scripture, right? So that we can always be um, and not only that we study the word, we also obey it, right? There is no use of studying and studying and then we lack obedience, right? So we always have to be studying and then um, and then uh Uh, obeying the word of God, okay? Here's another one. 1 John 3, 1. See what great love 
The Father has lavished. Lavish means extravagant, right? Generous on us that we should be called children of God. And that is what we are. The reason the world does not know us is that it did not know him. So Jesus Christ has lavished, generously given us everything, right? And so that's why Jesus plus nothing is everything, right? Jesus is um, everything to us. So that's why, because Christ in us, the hope of glory, because Christ in us, right, the fullness of the Godhead is in us, because Christ is the source of everything. That's why we can say no to failure, right? No to sickness and diseases, right? No to oppression. No to sin, those habitual sin. We rebuke them. No to broken relationship because Jesus reconciles, right? He's a reconciler. No to poverty. No to discouragements. I know we get discouraged, right? We get disappointed, but we say no. Because when we think of who we are in Christ, our position in Christ, and when we see the position of Christ in us, the hope of glory, all of this should be eliminated, right? Of, of course, there's the normal, it's our normal kind of living that we have to face. But what am I saying is sometimes we forget to look who we have or what we have, right? And we are just going into our normal lives, right? With our normal thinking, with our normal, with our eyes, right? We're going through that. And then what happened? We forgot that greater is he that is in us than he is in the world, right? He is greater. We have something greater in us, right? That we have to acknowledge all the time, Christ in me, the hope of glory. Hope of glory, the hope of glory. It is getting close, right? It is getting near. If we watch the news, you know, it's getting close for our bridegroom to come, right? And to, to by the twinkling of an eye, that we are taken, the dead of Christ, will, the, 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 the dead will rise first, and then us is being taken. And we are being transformed from glory to glory. We are being transformed, glorious body, and we meet God in the air. Amen? Amen. So let's think about who we are in Christ. And, um, and we have to battle some of our, even our own, mindset right our own negativities we have to battle all these things okay and have the christ in us rule and always think about the position of christ in us and our position in christ amen let's all stand praise god